when we're in nature, we're actually, in a very healthy way, stimulating the sensory pathways into the brain. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Pudua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. As we take a break from recording, we have chosen to replace several of our greatest hits for you to enjoy. We hope that you are able to gain insight for your educational journey. We are here today talking to Andrew about his background in child brain development. And Andrew, last week, it was a fascinating conversation that I thought I'd just take a minute or two to recap and you can correct me where I'm wrong because it was a little technical. You talked about your background and your history with Glenn Doman of the Brain Development Institute. Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential. Human Potential. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's quite a noble task to take on human potential. And you talked about the different aspects of the brain, the stem, which is the bottom part that's connected to the spinal cord, the pons, which sits on the stem, Mm -hmm. midbrain, Mm -hmm. and cortex. Cortex. And there's two halves to a cortex. Two cortices, yeah. And (laughs) and you told us that if we were to open up the top of a brain, we could stick a ruler between the two cortices. Yeah, I'm not sure that'd be really good for anybody, but just to illustrate the point that the, the hemispheres are connected not with each other, but they're connected at the the corpus callosum. And so, so much of what we do as human beings, using both sides of our body, both ears to locate sound, both eyes to track Mm -hmm. when we're reading, both hands to play an instrument or write, we are needing a well-organized midbrain to do that. And very often children who have difficulty using both sides of their cortex The problem isn't in the cortex per se, it's often a midbrain issue. Right. And you were also saying that you've seen children who were blind or who were deaf able to now see and hear and walk, not because their eye was damaged, but because the part of the brain that was helped them see was injured. Mm -hmm. And because of neuroplasticity, or the ability of the brain to adapt and change and parts of the brain that were not designed to do that function of see or hear or move, now able to take over that job, we see marvelous possibilities. And it's even more exciting today than it was when I was getting involved in this study 25 years ago. Right, right. And We also talked about the difference between creeping and crawling and Mm -hmm. why that's important. Crawling on your belly, creeping on your hands and knees. Right. And the cross lateral motion that the children learn, and that helps them to use both sides of their brain Mm -hmm. in conjunction with each other. So that crawling on the belly and creeping in particular are prerequisite towards good bilateral function that, of course, is necessary when walking or running, or dancing, or doing anything with both hemispheres at the same time. So that we see a lot of children who are struggling in one of those higher functioning areas to help that in the most efficient way is put them back on the floor and have them, as I did when I was with the School for Human Development, creep 1,600 meters a day for a year. Right, and you are working with adults, young adults yes. doing this. Yeah, and of course, it is the older the child, the harder it is to affect change. Mm-hmm. The younger the child, the easier it is to maximize the neuroplasticity of the brain. Right. So I would like to ask basically two questions. One, I think, is a pretty short answer, and the other I'd like you to spend most of your time on, if that's okay. The first is, how does a brain get injured? And the second is, what can we do about it? Well, brain injury occurs because of a lack of oxygen to brain cells. Hmm. 
So cells, when they don't have oxygen, die. This can happen, of course, in many different ways. You can have a brain injury that is prenatal. So while a mother is pregnant, there can be things that cut off the flow of blood or restrict the flow of blood to the baby's brain in development. Anything from excessive drugs and alcohol, and then we get things like fetal alcohol syndrome, things like that, or it could actually be an injury, someone falling down, or sometimes it can be just a restriction that we don't ever know about, a, uh, a twisting of the cord or mm-hmm. something internally that, that you never know about. Mm-hmm. So prenatal can cause a restriction of blood to the brain. Now, if you get too much, of course, death is what occurs. Right. But the body will protect the brain at all costs essentially. This is one reason when we look at seizures, hmm. when we see people who suffer from seizures or have a, a seizure for the first time, it's very often that there's something going on there that's cutting the flow of oxygen. And so what will happen is they, the body will shut itself down. It'll shut down mobility. It'll freeze itself in order to protect the brain. Hmm. So the brain is the last to go. <laughs> basically. Right. You can have neonatal injuries because of difficulty at birth. You can have, like I said, a twisted cord, or if a baby comes out blue, you look at maybe, okay, there's a lack of oxygen there. You can have postnatal injuries. Children get hurt all the time. When mm-hmm. I was five and a half years old, I ran full speed, as fast as I could, straight into a solid metal basketball pole. Oh, good job. (laughs) And I had a lump on my forehead. Well, that probably is the source of most of my problems today. (laughs) I don't know. But concussions, you know, any Mm. anything. You see, unfortunately, postnatally, you see very tragic cases of drowning. Yeah. You also see nutritional deprivation can be a source. So there's so many things we would call an etiology. Hmm. Or, you know, the study of the cause of things. And that often helps in the diagnosis as well as evaluating the function. But all of those things are just part of being human. All right. So lots of possible ways for the brain to be injured. Mm -hmm. So like you shared in the last episode, there's a spectrum. There's the comatose and there's the perfectly flawless. And most of us are somewhere in between. Yes, We're all brain injured. Right. So how can, whether it be you and I as adults, or whether it be our adult children, or whether it be our teens or younger students, what what can we do to help our children become more brilliant? Well, we look at basic principles. On the sensory development side, it's stimulation with frequency, intensity, and duration. So the more varied the environment, the healthier it will be for our neurological function and and our understanding and our relationship. So talk about this in nature deficit disorder. Right. I was just thinking of that talk. If you're in a room where it's kind of limited, always, you're going to have limited visual stimulation, limited auditory stimulation, limited tactile stimulation. If you're in nature... There's much more variety. Right. The trees are all different. The waves are all different. There's a continuous flow of variety. The sounds are continuously varied and flowing. The tactile experiences from the wind on the face to the sitting on a bumpy log. So when we're in nature, we're actually, in a very healthy way, stimulating the sensory pathways into the brain. And when we're not, when we're locked in a room or staring at a screen, we're depriving those sensory pathways. So that would be one practical example is get outside. Music. We can take the whole area of music in terms of sensory stimulation and look at variety and complexity in music versus monotony Mm -hmm. or repetition. Mm -hmm. And we see then the research indicates that the more complex and varied the music the better result it has on the developing brains of rodents that are tested in mazes and by extension other mammals. Mm -hmm. So there's that whole area. One area that almost all children 
benefit from hugely, and they crave this, is balance development. Mm. Balance development is part of, it happens in an area of the midbrain connected with the corpus callosum. And so as we naturally will tend to take our children, now our grandchildren, (laughs) you're waiting, and we'll throw them up in the air and we'll spin them around. And especially the dads will play with babies and young children in this very physical way. This is good Mm -hmm. because it's stimulating the balance areas of the brain. And then as the child gets a little older, it will often, he or she will often do things repetitively to develop that area. So I think you probably remember when you're a kid or your children, just endless somersaults. Mm -hmm. Or I remember a school where near where I lived, there was a big hill with ivy. And we would, as kids, six, seven, eight, nine, climb up the stairs and roll down the hill and climb up the stairs and roll and do it for, for hours. Right. Now, if I did that now, I would probably be sick and last about two minutes. But That's that balanced development. And then, of course, you can move from that into very conscious cortical balance development activities such as gymnastics Mm -hmm. that are going to require not only the balance, but the very precise use of both sides of the cortex to control arms and legs and even fingers and toes. When, When my boys were growing up, we had this wonderful tree in our front yard, and they loved to climb that tree. It was a very sad day when that tree was cut down, not by us, but by the people that we sold the house to. But I wonder how many parents are a little nervous about letting their children climb a tree because it could be dangerous. Well, everything's dangerous. Sure. But once again, I would refer people to that talk, Nature Deficit Disorder, the title, which I stole straight from Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods. Mm-hmm. And great, great things to read and, and I think very important because that is the natural environment in which children grow their brains, instinctively so. So there's a bit of risk with that, but it's worth taking. Sure. Now, children who can't do that in a natural environment or because they don't have that level of mobility, we provide that for them. Mm -hmm. So we can provide balance development. We can provide patterning to help with the creeping and crawling. We can provide activities that strengthen laterality. Now, that would be... A very important thing, I think, to talk about, because most of our listeners don't have immobile children who can't talk. Right. But a lot of us have children who may have a mild type of injury that's interfering with their easily learning things. So many questions we get from families who have dysgraphic, dyslexic, ADHD students. And there are, of course, many causes. Mm -hmm. Dyslexia... As I noted in that article I wrote, we can refer people to thoughts on dyslexia, is a term to describe a symptom of which there can be various causes. Sure. But one of them that bears directly on this conversation would be laterality. Okay. Laterality is a dominance. It's when we as humans establish our sidedness. Mm. This is most obvious in handedness. Mm -hmm. And so 80, 90% of people are right handed handed, right. but 10, 20% of people are not right-handed. They are left-handed. And what this has to do with is our laterality or our dominance, and it, it is a genetic disposition. My mother's left-handed. Mm-hmm. And I am not. <laughs> no. So you could have, you know, it skip a few generations, mm-hmm. and then, boom, out of the blue, mm-hmm. you have a left-handed child because great-grandma or great-grandpa right. or something. Mm-hmm. But laterality can be a problem for learning when it is a mixed dominance. Mm -hmm. And the way this usually happens is if you have a child, for example, who is meant to be Mm right-sided, that's their genetic predisposition, and if they're going to be right-handed, then they should also be right-eyed, right-eared, right-footed. They should attack life Mm -hmm. in a unified way. However, you can have a mild brain injury, dead brain cells for one reason or another, in the dominant hemisphere that can interfere with dominance. So you might be right-handed, but you have some injury in the dominant hemisphere that controls your right side in, say, the visual area. And so then you may be left-eyed 
and right-handed, a mixed laterality. Mm -hmm. That's going to make it harder to read. That Mm. would contribute to a mild dyslexia. Mm. And in this case, a behavioral ophthalmologist can often help to identify a mixed laterality, and there are things that can be done to treat that. For example, patch the non-dominant eye and kind of force the brain to develop dominance in the side that corresponds with the rest of the dominance. Mm -hmm. So you can observe this in children. I remember one little boy in particular we, we had. He was a brilliant kid, but he was so mixed in his laterality he would write for a while with his right hand. When he'd get tired, he'd try to write with his left <laughs> hand. And he, you know, he'd be switching it back and forth all while he was writing or drawing. And of course, his writing or drawing was confused and, mm-hmm. and messy. But that was an example of a mixed dominance. Another very easy to see example is stuttering. Mm. So when someone has a stuttering thing going on, it's usually because the, the sides of the brain are fighting right? So our dominant hemisphere would be connected with the language and executive function. So in right-handed people, left cortex, whereas the subdominant hemisphere is the one with the intuitive artistic type of thing. Mm. So when we're speaking, we're generally relying on that dominant hemisphere. But what if you have an injury in your dominant hemisphere in the language area? The other hemisphere will try to take over the job and compensate for that. And so it's actually almost a a battle going on. Someone's trying to say something and hard to get it out. Their cortices are fighting. I'll say it. No, I'll say it. No, I'll say it. No, I'll say it. No, you shut up. I'm dominant. No, you're hurt. I'll do the job. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, that person has to exercise their willpower and say basically to their cortices, you shut up, Mm -hmm. you do your job, and make that happen. But it can be very exhausting. Mm -hmm. That can happen with language, it can happen manually, it can happen with eyes. Try this experiment. Close your left eye and look at me with your right eye. Now switch. Now switch. Now switch. <laughs> now switch as fast as you can back and forth. Now imagine that's your brain mm. all the time. Right. Right? Well, that would make it very hard to read, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. That would actually, you would describe that as the letters are jumping around. Yes which is sometimes what kids who are struggling will say. They're moving. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Mm -hmm. So that visual dominance is very important to having a smoother reading. Now, that's not the only cause of what could be termed dyslexia or dysgraphia, but it is one thing to consider. At what age do you, do children usually exert their dominance? You can tell. Yeah, good question. Generally, you want to see a good solid dominance by around six years old, Hmm. plus or minus a bit, you know, because maturity varies. You wouldn't really worry about a three-year-old who's showing mixed dominance. They're just trying stuff out. They're just experimenting. Their brain's still sorting things out. But if you've got a child like the one I mentioned, Neil, Mm -hmm. who can't figure out which hand to hold the pen at when he's seven, that's when you think, okay, we've got to focus in on this and establish laterality. And so you can do that. Right. And a good laterality would be to be, like I said, right-eyed. If you're right-sided, right-eyed, which means you get your dominant image through the right eye. Mm -hmm. You can check this by pointing at something and closing one eye. So if, if you look at me right now, you see that my finger and my right eye are lined up with your right eye. Mm -hmm. So I'm exhibiting right eye, right hand dominance, naturally pointing at you like this. Mm -hmm. So you can say to children, you know, point at my fist and put it right under your eye and see. And if they're moving around, Mm -hmm. right, if their finger's not staying at one spot and they're kind of going back and forth, that could be showing a mixed visual laterality. Mm -hmm. You want to work on that. Kicking right? Which which foot would you naturally kick with or which foot would you naturally save yourself? So sometimes we would, to check this, come up behind a child and just give them a little nudge forward and see which foot would they use to catch themselves with. Mm. And if that's consistent, then that's indicative of laterality in a mobility way. And if it's not consistent, then that could be the opposite. So working to establish laterality 
can be so helpful. And it's one of those subtler signs, too. Like I said, you're not obviously unable to hear, unable to walk, but you could have a child with those types of issues. Matthew at the uh, Family Hope Center. Matthew Newell. Matthew Newell. They see children on the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, they see children who are so mildly hurt that no one would ever notice Mm -hmm. that they had any problem unless you got very close and working with them very closely on a daily basis. And they see other children who are, you know, literally paralyzed and blind and deaf. So if you were to give, say, a two or three point prescription for any parent with any child, you know, five or seven, let's say seven, they've exerted some dominance, they know that they're either right-handed or left-handed, what kind of things could you recommend to them to help them accelerate? We used running, jogging, running, and swimming as cortical development programs because those are reinforcing that cross-pattern motion at a very high level. So cross-pattern. And of course, oxygen is a critical component for good brain function. So children who have regular good exercise Mm. that involves running and or swimming this is going to promote good brain function. And I, I just have to qualify this because I used to teach swimming. You're talking about front crawl, not butterfly or breaststroke, because well, I think not all, cross pattern. No, I think they all would because mm. swimming is a cortical type of activity. You're intentionally using both sides, both sides of your body right. in even a if, particular way. But even if you're doing it at the same time. Sure. Mm-hmm. You're intentionally doing that. Right. When you're a nine-month-old baby on the floor creeping, mm-hmm. you're not intentionally doing anything. <laughs> right. right. You're not, you don't have your cortex telling, move your right hand and your left foot. Now <laughs> right. move your left hand and your right knee. No. But when you're swimming, right, and you've taught swimming, mm-hmm. so you're intentionally saying, Move your legs like this, Mm -hmm. move your arms like this, move your head like that. That's all cortical function. Interesting, yep. That'd be one thing. Dance and gymnastics are another thing that are going to strengthen that whole mobility, balance, respiration pathway. So having children involved in, in choreographed dance, gymnastics, by extension, martial arts, those are all very good for that mobility pathway. Certainly... The things we've talked about, focused listening helps to build the auditory pathway, particularly if you're listening to high quality, complex music, preferably say of a, a classical nature, but mm-hmm. you know, there's many different types of complex musics. You are wanting to, again, be sure that child has lots of time in a sensory rich environment, Mm -hmm. even to the point where they have different smells and different tastes. Having kind of a a parent-child battle, eat the vegetables, try this food. The parent instinctively knows that trying more foods is good for the child. And the child may or may not like the idea of trying foods that look weird or they've had a bad experience with in the past. So, but, you know, we'll even do that is give with babies just the tiniest little taste of a wide variety of foods to help grow the gustatory olfactory pathway. So the the five-year-old child who refuses to eat anything but macaroni and cheese and bananas, mom can say, this will make you smarter if you try this broccoli. <laughs> well, that type of logic won't fly with a five-year-old. So, I, you know, it is interesting. Some of Matthew's newest work, and this was developed after I left, really, mm-hmm. the, the field there, has to do with the relationship between olfactory stimulation and sensitivity and emotional intelligence or Mm -hmm. emotional stability and what they find is that very often children who have a hypersensitivity to taste or smell very often do exhibit emotional imbalances and there's a way to help correct the one through a stimulation of the other yes i remember him talking about this he would say that they enjoyed bad smells so it was disordered yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, people can listen to this DVD. Mm-hmm. They can go to familyhopecenter.com, familyhopecenter.org, and read a whole lot more about what Matthew and Carol and their team have been doing. And if there are listeners out there who 
you know, have listened to these two podcasts and are feeling, wow, I, I see something in one of my kids that sounds kind of like what they were talking about. It's worth it to explore that now and maybe even go to Philadelphia and, and take the course and right. learn the whole thing. One thing we know for sure, it is easier to fix a problem the younger a child is. Right. So talking about needing frequency, intensity, and duration, if you're working with babies, a little bit goes a long way. Right. If you're working with kids who are four, five, six, it's a lot easier to affect a change than if you're working with kids 14, 15, 16. Be, just because of the neuroplasticity and the age and the brain is still growing and there's so much more ease in working. So if you think you have an issue, investigate, address the issue, do a program of treatment now. Mm -hmm. Even if it costs some time and money, it'll cost less time and money than if you wait five or ten years. Right, right. Well, Andrew, this has been a fascinating two episodes, and I'm sure our listeners agree with me. Thank you for letting us you know, deviate just a little bit. I know this is in your history. This is in your background. So maybe it's not as much of a deviation to you as perhaps we might think. But I think this has been very helpful as we continue to learn how to pursue excellence in writing. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us for one of our favorite episodes. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or you can visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. New recordings will begin airing in January of 2020. Until then, we hope you'll join us each week as we revisit our greatest hits. Mm -hmm.